Yes. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining in. And uh, I'm just going to go through a very, very brief uh, set of slides, just maybe three or four, uh, just to get us going, just to introduce what we mean by data life cycle. And then we can open it up for, for questions uh, that you guys have. I have a set of questions that, uh, possible set of questions. And then there are some questions submitted by the workshop participants when they registered. So, um, so I'm Anirban Mandal. I'm from Renaissance Computing Institute at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, I'm the assistant director for network research and infrastructure there. And I'm also a co-PI on the CICOE pilot project. So um, what we mean by data life cycle to start with. So when we developed this data life cycle model, um, we were mainly concentrating on uh, large facilities, the NSF large facilities in general, but this can be extended to, uh, to many other uh, small and large scientific facilities. So by data life cycle, what we mean is, is basically a model that captures the end-to-end the -end data movement from where the data is captured by scientific instruments and sensors to the ultimate dissemination and, and access of the data by the scientists to do further research, right? So, so what we, uh, so every day life cycle starts with, with what we call as a data capture uh, step, right? So there's some kind of uh, sensor instrument uh, that is used to, to capture the initial data uh, for, for different kinds of facilities. So it could be a telescope, it could be uh, sensors in the field, it could, be, uh, uh, it could be the DOMS as in ice cube, it could be the grape uh, sensor boats as in, as in neon, uh, it could be telescopes and the optical infrared. So you, you have the whole gamut of uh, scientific instruments which are generating uh, large volumes of data. And then uh, that's a data capture step. Everything starts from there, right? And then there, you might have some kind of initial processing of the data that happens really close to where the data is generated or where the data is measured. Uh, that step we call as initial processing step. It's often at the a sensor site uh, or very near where the data collection really happens, right? You could do some initial filtering of the data. You could generate some alerts. You could, you could do a variety of processing, but not very, very heavyweight uh, because you might not have the entire compute capacity uh, very close to where the data is captured, right? Then in most general cases, data is moved by various means uh, through, through network circuits, through, uh, through normal internet, through satellite, boats, uh, a whole, uh, whole lot of mechanisms to what we call as a central processing step where, where, where you do the bulk of processing in one or more uh, data centers or compute processing uh, uh, places, right? It could be distributed set of resources. It could be from campus clusters. It could be uh, the NSF uh, uh, um, uh, supercomputers. It could be Exceed. It could be OSG. Uh, depends on what what facility uh, ac accesses what kind of compute uh, compute resources, right? So central processing could happen in one or more data centers. And uh, you then uh, kind of archive the data, you store the data and curate the data, right? And it is debatable as to what happens before and after. So these arrows in the data life cycle model are, are very simple to start with, but, but you could have a lot of nuances in terms of what happens uh, in terms of that there being loops or there being other kinds of dependencies between these stages, right? So data archiving and storage is also very important um, portion of the data life cycle. Uh, and um, since, since the scientific facilities um, gather very important and very, uh, uh, very relevant data for, for decades, uh, the archiving storage backup um, of the data is very important, right? And, and that could also happen in multiple places. You could use cloud resources to, to do to, to backups. Uh, um, so there are multiple technologies could be used for this state of the real life cycle. And after that, pretty much the data is distributed in different means through, through portals, through programmatic means, through, 
uh, uh, th through 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 grid FTB, you could you could basically uh, share the data to the ultimate stakeholders, the scientists, and the and the and the scientific community that's using the data that's collected by uh, by these facilities, right? Uh, so. So what I call uh, the, these steps are the most basic, very, very high level steps of the real life cycle. And then there are certain steps which are cross cutting across the st stages, right? So for example, data movement, it's, it's kind of central to, to the real life cycle stages and they, they cross cut across these different stages. Uh, other cross cutting CI elements could be identity management, could be disaster recovery, so which affect multiple stages of a data life cycle. So those are, those are what we call as cross-cutting elements um, of the data life cycle. Um, so, so what are the goals for data life cycle, right? So we, we wanted to understand and document the, the CI best practices and, and solutions for large facilities. And uh, when, we, when we started studying these large facilities, it was, um, uh, we thought that can a generalized data life cycle abstraction help us understand this diverse CI landscape across the, across the facilities? Uh, can, it be, can it be one way to learn and catalog the CI functionalities for each stage of the data life cycle? And then what are the services that are offered by each stage, right? What are the CI architecture elements that, that support this, each of these stages, right? And then, um, and then study this end-to-end -end life cycle for data as it traverses through the different CI entities uh, and then catalog the underlying services and, and the tools and platforms for this, for this stage. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's a model that, uh, it's a very simple model that tries to capture some of the common elements across scientific facilities. And then uh, we can think about the different challenges uh, uh, and, uh, and different technologies that can help solve those challenges for each of these uh, stages and also the cross-cutting stages, right? So, um, you know, uh, at this point, I'll, I'll pause and uh, let, let the participants uh, go at me, like ask questions in terms of um, uh, do they have, do you have, uh, do you, uh, are you represented representing a large facility, are representing research organization, uh, research computing. So different people have different views of their life cycle. And, um, and I'll just open it up for discussion at, at this point. I have some questions here, uh, which, which, my, which I might use to, to for all the, uh, the discussion, but um, please go ahead and um, unmute yourself and, and, and ask questions if you got some. Uh, so I guess uh, to to get it started, um, uh, I'll I'll just go go with the first question. Do you think uh, like for for whatever facility you're representing, whatever organization you're representing, um, do you think this real life cycle? Can... Sorry, sorry. Uh, do you think that this real life cycle uh, figure captures all the steps that data goes through in your organization? Do you think any critical stages are missing? I know it's early in the morning. Somebody can, uh, can get it going. Um, Could you maybe put up the figure again? Sure. Yeah, so, so what, I, uh, what, I, what we're seeing as we talk to a lot of these large facilities that um, 
uh, one of the important concerns is is basically um, how do you uh, uh, how do you do say do say disaster recovery right how do you do migration of certain data and services from um, uh, uh, from the normal platforms to maybe a cloud platform right so uh, there are there are different issues that that are raised when uh, you are trying to when you're, when when you're trying to say migrate from an older technology to a newer technology, right? So, you you really need to need to understand what are the uh, what, what's the what the CI that's available, what CI you have, and what are the expertise that you need to need to build up to to get to uh, get to where uh, where you want to migrate to, right? So, uh, there are different issues that come up for. Uh, for another cross-cutting element that comes up a lot in our discussions is um, how do you actually support um, fair data principles uh, in this framework, right? So, uh, and and having fair attributes is very important. Uh, is it is an important concern for for large facilities to uh, to, to to satisfy, right? So, um, yeah. So it's. Um, uh, it, it's a very general model, but there are, there are lots of nuances that that, that are either cross cutting or even the CI for for each of these steps can be can be incredibly complicated, right? You, um, like for central processing, you could think about say for example Ice Cube, right? Ice Cube's uh, central uh, Ice Cube central central processing uh, starts happening at at UW uh, where where most of the data lands up from the South Pole, but then they use a variety of uh, distributed resources from, from OSG campus clusters. They even use, uh, uh, have experimented with, with different cloud platforms um, to see, uh, uh, to perform central processing, right? And even then, if you think about data movement, right, they, they do a lot of data movement from EW to wherever they're, they're backing up to maybe NERSC, uh, they might move data to to Europe to to, to the Daisy facility, um, so it's it's every every step can be can be incredibly uh, complicated and depends on also on the particular facility. Like for example, in Ice Cube, uh, the 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 alert dissemination goes through a very different path than the normal data product generation, right? So, uh, I'd I'd like to get your viewpoints on on the different nuances that you might be having uh, in your facilities. Uh, and how we could refine refine the real life cycle model to uh, to to get to there. I don't specifically work at a large facility, but I spent a lot of time doing data work in libraries. And a couple of uh -huh. things that are probably in here that are implicit but not explicitly stated mm -hmm. are like the planning steps for how you figure out what you're going to do in the future, even before you start collecting the data, and right. also change management for when things change. But also, right. uh, as you're recording data, recording metadata. So, uh -huh. right. So, uh, so the first point that you touched upon is very important. Like doing a requirement analysis for uh, uh, for any of these steps, right? So, that's uh, so we have asked uh, a lot of lot, lot of the facilities as to uh, the the systematic requirement, requirement analysis. Many of them have, have documents, many of them have, have a process, but it's not, uh, it's not done as systematically as it, as it could be done, right? Uh, in terms of change management, I think um, it's very important because every facility goes through, goes through transitions, right? Every, every three to five years, uh, things would change, right? Either the funding cycle or uh, new technology comes in or, uh, uh, you know, so there is, uh, you, you need to keep continuing serving the data to the scientific community, but you, you'd, uh, you need to, uh, need, need to manage how do you migrate from what you have to uh, where you want to be, right? So I think, I think those, are, those are very important, uh, interesting concerns that you brought up. The other angle that you talked about is, um, is uh, uh, is where, where all the curation and uh, library science technologies come come in, and we're actually thinking about um, expanding the notion for the archiving and storage step 
in this uh, uh, in this model to to also include include data curation, uh, which 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 is very very important for for really long term long term data management, right? And and many of these large facilities like serve data for decades, right? So so data curation is a very important step, and many of the technologies that we uh, that we learn from from library sciences information sciences are, are very useful um, uh, we have a project member in our team who is uh, who is from iu uh, angela morillo who is uh, uh, who is who is an expert in in data curation and we are uh, we're incorporating that uh, into into this model mm -hmm. So one of the things that I ran into with researchers when I was in the library was that I would get their data at the end of their project and have to cure, help them curate it from scratch. Mm -hmm. But if you're working in a large facility, you have the opportunity to kind of integrate curation throughout the entire process and it makes the endpoint yeah. a lot easier. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, it, 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 there's also a relation between curation and supporting fair principles, right? So, um, and uh, that's uh, that's another impetus that that a lot of the scientific facilities have now that there's a push for both uh, like um, supporting the fair principles and um, yeah the other aspect I think which I didn't talk about very um, uh, very much is the whole issue of identity management right so um, how do you how do you know who is accessing a large facility who has uh, what rights to do what, and you want to make it easier, uh, easier for uh, easier for um, uh, uh, for for people to to access for scientists to access the access the data repositories, right? Uh, so it's also both from uh, from a facility perspective, and it's also from the from the users perspective, right? From a facility perspective, you sometimes really want to know a trail of. Who is using your facility? Who is accessing your data? Uh, it's also used for, for reporting to to say NSF, who is uh, who is supporting these facilities, right? So, uh, so those those concerns are 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 also important, right? Yeah. So, uh, Doug, I see you are uh, you are in here. Do you want to give a perspective from from Gage? Uh, uh, about the data life cycle or or any of this in, uh, any other steps in the in the DLC um, yeah I was thinking about it because we're kind of in the process and I was we kinda, we're kind of in the process of blowing our data life cycle up if you want to think of it that way because we're redefining it the way yeah. we're going to process data and I was one of the things we have to worry about, of course, is keeping compatibility with the old as well, because there are still people that rely on the old way of processing things and will have to support and hopefully slowly migrate them off that. But yeah, mm -hmm. um, the only other thing I was thinking about is, and I don't know if it's true in all facilities, but our archiving to backup really occurs at the initial processing stage. Right. Right. Yeah, it's not anywhere we do i mean the the other data we keep around forever uh so it's really not as much archiving uh as the initial data stays around for a while and get, then gets archived in case we ever have to if there's questions about the data and that kind of thing right uh, yeah that, that's why i said like the the initial processing center processing and archiving and storage step it, it you could have it in 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 many different orders, right? I mean, right. as you said, that you could capture and put in the storage, and you could do the filtering there. You could do the processing on there. Uh, you could do everything, and then you could put it in storage. Uh, say, for example, in Neon. Um, so it de it really depends on uh, on the facility and on, and and ultimately on the science you are you're trying to do, right? For example, in Ice Cube, uh, you uh, you'd uh, want to get the filtered data. Um, uh, because you really can't get access to the whole data set on the South Pole because you, you just don't have the bandwidth to get it to uh, to to get the entire data set to UW, right? It's just not possible in that case, right? And uh, sometimes you you uh, you have uh, depending on the science you have uh, the the users getting access to only maybe the higher level data products, right? So. 
it, it really depends on on the type of uh, the type of science and the, and the facility of, of uh, doing that. Right. Yeah. It's also true that technology might advance that you can filter and process things initially in a better way. I talked to a research yeah. group that does hyperspectral radar that was bringing that up recently. Uh, uh, hyperspectral. Uh, which which group is that? Um, it's uh, the Townsend group at UW Madison. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, uh, nowadays uh, there are there are a lot of technologies that uh, uh, that are that we might uh, classify as edge technologies, right? So uh, there's a lot of work that's that's being done close to the edge of the data collection. So uh, you could do very uh, very high fidelity. Um, stream calculations very close to the data capture, right? And you might even uh, start dissemination there. So it really depends on uh, um, on the type of science that uh, and uh, we if, if every facility will have a different version of this real life cycle, right? So, but this is kind of a think of this uh, not encompass in, not encompassing all the scientific facilities, but uh, but as a template that that facilities can start with, and then uh, you can you can expand, you can uh, uh, you can add more arrows, you could add loops in there. So uh, that's it's a way to 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 catalog the best practices and to uh, uh, to start reasoning about um, CI, right? So another another interesting use case for a data lifecycle is is uh, what we call as disaster recovery planning, right? So for every step in this uh, in life cycle, you might have to bake in disaster recovery, right? And then to plan for disaster recovery, it really helps you to break, break your CI down into multiple stages and then really reason about, okay, is this step really important? Can this step be done later on? Some steps might be, uh, might be, uh, uh, might be very very critical, and you need you might need to recover at the earliest, right? So that you don't lose any data. For example, capture might be one of the steps, right? You, if something goes wrong in the data capture step, you would like to really have a disaster recovery mechanism kick in as soon as possible, so that you don't uh, don't lose the data. But central processing, maybe it can wait. Uh, if, if something goes down, maybe it will be a little bit delayed to 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 generate an higher level data product, but you could uh, you could actually wait a little longer. So when you when you plan for disaster recovery, uh, you could think of these stages as as uh, as your guiding principles for for determining the priorities for what services to recover uh, uh, sooner rather than later. Right. So this this again is a framework to to make those decisions. Um, so let me, uh, so uh, do any of the participants um, are, I, I, I know the answer for Gates, but are there any other participants who are thinking about uh, uh, using cloud resources for, uh, for, doing, uh, uh, for doing parts of the uh, operations of, this, of their scientific facilities? Um, and if so, uh, what are your experiences for doing that? Uh, maybe, maybe none of the participants are uh, thinking in that uh, in those lines. But that's fine. Uh, I see uh, there's someone from Hui. Uh, uh, do you represent OI by any chance? Uh, yeah, no, I I, um, I do not. I work with R2R, uh, Rolling okay. Deck Repository. Yeah, okay. that's my work is primarily with them. Um, I do some work with OI, but that's not. Yeah, their yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, I mean, even R2R, right? It it does capture. I mean, the daily life cycle captures not the uh, like for R2R. It's uh, you basically start from uh, after the data capture from the ships, right? So you have the ships collecting that data and then, then that data is delivered to R2R. And then after 
after that, most of the steps are handled by by R to R, correct? Like you do some some processing in Colombia, if I remember correctly, right? And yeah, that's then... that's correct. We have um, a couple separate um, departments. So uh, Columbia, Hui, um, Samos, they all do a little bit of quality assessment um, and very limp, like very little processing, and then we kind of have it available for others right. to use. Right, mm -hmm. right. But and, uh, and I've gone to the R2R website and uh, I've seen like for every every cruise you you basically have different kinds of uh, different kinds of data right both from like uh, 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 like so I don't know whether the science party data is uh, is available from the R2R portal or or is it mostly the the data that's the common data that's collected by the by the ships is available to everyone. So, so we we own our platforms for underway data. So um, all the okay. instruments are attached to the ship, really. So if a science party brings their own equipment, right. we don't really deal with that data. Right. I see. I see. So uh, uh, so thinking about like ARF, right? If you look at the life cycle, uh, some of the interesting concerns for ARF would be in the data transmission, data movement area, right? Uh, because the ships are operating in a very remote area, uh, so and they're mostly using uh, uh, like satellite uh, communications, right? From there, many of the technologies used by others might not might not work there because they assume uh, you have uh, you have very reliable connections to the internet, right? So, for example, identity management would be very different for uh, uh, for uh, for a facility like ARF, than for a facility like Gage or or uh, uh, or other other facility more, which are more uh, might have more reliable internet connection, right? So, the different aspects of uh, of the data life cycle uh, or the cross cross cutting stages become become important for different facilities, and you would need to uh, look into those stages uh, much more uh, much more closely. Uh, any other questions? Um, so uh, let me ask a more general question about uh, the, the scientific community inside your organizations or the universities. Um, uh, so in terms of the resource providers, right? What kind of resource providers are they primarily looking at? I know it's a gamut, gamut out, out there. Uh, like they might be using Exceed resources, maybe the DOE National Lab resources, OSG, and others. So, uh, do you increasingly see uh, see more heterogeneity? I would, I would imagine, um, or or do you see a consolidation there? And and what are the universities? Maybe research computing uh, uh, departments of the of the universities thinking in those in those lines, right? And I'm sure there's a cloud story there. And I did attend um, a few of the sessions uh, uh, in Park and uh, some of the CARC sessions. So I know that uh, uh, there are a lot of people who are who are looking into into that uh, that that problem. So so in terms of uh, this is. This is this is processing beyond the data collection, beyond the large facility boundary, where it really goes to the entire scientific community. And then, in this continuum, there are there are lots of issues that we are not actually capturing in this life cycle model. So, I would like to get get any input, uh, any comments and suggestions on on that end of things. Since it's quiet, I'll talk. Tom from University of Utah, Representative Carr, Campus Research Computing Consortium, and also a, a direct to research computing facility for the university. And I'm involved with Exceed and Blue Waters and all these projects. And uh, if you look across the NSF portfolio for Exceed, others, there is no data storage. There is no data life cycle. At my university, a researcher wants to have the most active storage as possible. They don't want to pay for backup ever. Yeah. So the whole data life cycle is awesome, 
but who's going to pay for it? And it comes back to what Tobin was saying. Um, you've got to prioritize it from the beginning, how you're going to do this, who's going to do it, where it's going to go, and are you going to invest the resources? And if you're at a large facility, am I going to put a new funky sensor to analyze the data, or am I going to pay for the data lifecycle? What's the priority of that right. process? Yeah, and, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a very, you know, this discussion comes up every time in, 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 in the CARC meetings and in many other meetings. It's, it's, mainly, it's mainly a sustainability question, right? And uh, how, how does the funding flow for data management? Right? Do you do, like most of the times, indirect charging through the university uh, is, the, is the way that it's kind of done, not, not ideal, right? You can convince your university to do that? I mean, that's, the, it's, it's hard, I right? mean, central IT uh, grows by millions each year, whereas research yeah. computing has been flat for a decade. Yeah. Uh, I know there are certain places who, uh, places who experiment with the condos of condos idea, where you, you, um, you provide some, some, some investment from your end, from the researcher, and then you get to leverage uh, across the uh, 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 across the university system, right? So it's not exactly uh, pay for play, but something similar to that. Uh, I, I know Clemson, I think, does condo of condos. I, I think Purdue has a similar model, but I'm not totally uh, exactly familiar with that. So th the different charging mechanisms are, are 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 complex, as you as you said, right? And the other aspect, there's a question here from one of the participants, but I don't know whether uh, he or she has joined in or not, right? So um, like what are the best practices for getting researchers to curate the data, in particular taking it off working storage attached to HPC, right? So, uh, you know, again, this managed backups is, is, is hard, to, hard to pay for, right? The, like researchers are generating data, right? There's, the storage is not unlimited. At some point of time, the scratch space fills up, right? And then the, then the, sign, then the sysadmin comes to the researcher and says, okay, you, you just need to get your data off this, off this machine. Like, what does the researcher do? So, right, I mean, these are some of the concerns. I mean, do you buy your own cold, cold storage from a cloud provider and move things in there? Then you are becoming your own uh, sysadmin for your, for your data sets, right? You, you do all the managed curation uh, yourself, right? Is that, a, is that a right way of doing it? Uh, I know there are some universities who are having these agreements with, uh, with Google or other cloud providers for unlimited storage for staff and fast, fast transport to maybe a drive, uh, to maybe Dropbox. So there are, I think there are uh, some efforts there, but uh, this is, this is a problem that's uh, that's bubbling up in the in the research community and it's bubbling up really hard where where people are really pressed for uh, pressed for storage and i think what your question was tom was the third one in this list how to get researchers uh, pay for the proper data management over the over the life cycle maybe yeah, and i'd say you you cannot it's impossible unless the funding agencies mandate it and the reason why the funding agencies haven't mandated it is because they can't pay for it. It's very expensive to curate data, to do the metadata, to do the full life cycle. I mean, yeah. I have a petabyte of data of, of research data for my lab, and I don't back it up because I can't pay double the price. I'd rather pay for a student or a postdoc to do yeah. the work. Um, it, it's a question of priorities. It comes back to what Tobin said in the beginning, is that you've got to plan it from the beginning and and I'll add, prioritize it. Decide that this is really critically important. Uh huh. Yeah. So, is that the general consensus in the CARC meetings? That uh, CARC, we don't talk about data lifecycle so much. Um, we're more about workforce development and mm -hmm. capabilities model and stuff. But it, it it's sorry, ubiquitous I, in my experience. Yeah. I, sorry, I, I actually meant the CASC meetings, not the CARC meetings. Uh, in, in, in CASC, uh, we tend to talk about these issues, right? So. Well, I mean, the, the biggest discussion is at the AAU APLU meeting, which has happened every year for the last, uh, I've been to two or three of them, I can't remember now. 
where we bring librarians and VPRs and research computing people together and we talk about how we all want to do fair data and all this stuff and then at the end of the meeting it's like oh yeah we can't afford this so let's go meet again next year and talk about it some more <laughs> so you, you think it's basically resource constrained at this point to to do anything yeah i mean and, and for the large facilities it's a question they have to decide of how much they want to prioritize the data are they willing to throw stuff away or do they really want to keep it forever and and that's a cost issue yeah yeah and 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 i think that's that's one thing that a lot of large facilities are actually thinking about and and when they're doing any, some of the updates and migration they are thinking about like like rethinking their design uh, from supporting fair principles being a, like a first class citizen rather than it comes later uh, uh, as an as an afterthought right so i think it's getting uh, importance uh, and which means getting more funding behind it, uh, like getting more people working inside the art facilities to actually um, uh, work on the fair aspects. So, yeah, I mean, it's not it's not there yet, but people are people are thinking. Um, uh, Doug or Rebecca, do you have uh, any inputs on that? Uh, Doug from the gauge gauge sage gauge angle. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about it and, and the interesting thing about Exceed not having it, it storage is, yeah, that's right, we are, we are actually working with Indiana to try and get some storage there, but the, the thing that came up to me was we're looking at cloud, or, um, commercial storage for, for a lot of our processing and stuff, and it, is this going to put up a barrier to researchers because now it's going to cost, well, it would cost us money for them to take month to take data out. Are we gonna charge them? I doubt it. So going back to life cycle, maybe this is something where we'll end up in our life cycle taking from commercial and pushing out to research institutes to keep our cost up. Right. And then once you do that, you have to always remember that uh, if you're doing that in the cloud, it's not necessarily cheap to do that, right? I mean right. You have to pay all the egress costs, and and again, it comes back to who is going to pay for what, right? All these researchers are used to getting all these services, quote unquote, free. Uh, yeah. There's a there's an expectation that you know it's going to be free forever, ever, and it's, it's the same thing as Tom was mentioning, like data storage, right? Uh, again, egress from cloud providers. It's I think uh, NASA is the example that did the experiment where they prepaid yeah. for a cloud solution and uh, allowed researchers to download it and immediately blew their budget within a few weeks um, because of that. Yeah, I mean that's uh, I mean that's a downside of of moving everything. To the cloud without a without a plan for for your data egress, right? You you either have to have negotiated uh, cloud connects or uh, express routes to to your facilities and then serve the data from there. You might have to have a have a kind of backup or replica from where you serve it. Right, it comes back to the pre planning and uh, AWS uh, as one example. I know they they do host some open data for like uh, weather. Yes. and other stuff that's free and they they don't do egress charges they do it as a service to the community but yeah. if we started giving them 100 petabytes they would not be so happy about that absolutely and yeah i mean one solution they would say okay why don't you compute right there i mean but then that's not always possible that you really want to use the entire ecos ecosystem for uh, um, for for compute for computing right so so and that's where um, the the planning and change management actually come in. You really need to plan your plan your CI uh, deployment and and also put the uh, put the money in the right buckets. For example, as as Tom mentioned, right? If you don't, you, if you hadn't thought about the data egress costs, your budget is just gone right there. You thought you were. Uh, uh, you have a lot of advantage, but then uh, you didn't think about that uh, uh, that cost. So, so yeah, I mean, it's always a complex problem of uh, 
uh, multi-dimensional uh, optimization problem that you have uh, where, where, where the cloud costs uh, definitely uh, start playing an important, uh, important role in there. Yeah, so uh, is Chris Ramses uh, uh, in here? Rajiv, do you, can you check? Uh, he's from oh, the- there's no one named by Chris on the participant so far. Okay, I think the, the fourth question is from, from, from Chris Ramses, um, who is from the uh, Research Vessels uh, team. Uh, he wanted to get a review of, uh, of the RCR feeder life cycle, but I'll, I'll reach out to him, uh, to him later. Yeah, so, so we are about uh, uh, 15 minutes away from, uh, from the end of this session. Um, I would um, like you guys to, if you have any more questions, this is the time to, um, and to ask them. And I would encourage you to, um, to attend the, the, the rest of the uh, workshop. Um, then uh, encourage you to uh, go to the CICOE pilot uh, website to get more resources and more pointers and documents and links uh, to things related to the life cycle. Um, we did have a paper uh, at PERC uh, on this, which has a lot more details, uh, a lot more examples uh, for the life cycle, but mostly from the large facilities uh, viewpoint. Um, so I would encourage you to, uh, uh, to read that paper. Maybe I should have uh, provided uh, uh, the citation here. Um, let me try to find it. Um, I'll paste the citation uh, on, the, on the chat. Um, and if, if there are no more questions, I would uh, I'd encourage you to attend the welcome and introduction uh, talk uh, at 1 p.m. for the workshop. And I, I, I'll be here in the next 15 minutes if, if anybody wants to ask any more follow-up questions. But, uh, but I think we have um, we've covered some, some important aspects for the real life cycle, some things that, that are important concerns for the research community in general, not just for large facilities. And uh, we, uh, we understood some more nuances in the real life cycle. You understood some of the cost considerations and and sustainability considerations for for both uh, for data storage uh, aspects, and uh, I would like to leave it leave it here unless somebody else has other questions. All right, um, hearing nothing. I uh, thank you for 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 joining us for this uh, office hour, and we'll see you see you in about one and a half uh, one or fifteen minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so I'd like to thank everyone for their participation and attending and thank you Anirban for leading the talks. Uh, just wanted to remind you everyone that we make the recordings and the slides available and have them sent over via email. And if you'd like to continue the discussions or have questions, we have a Slack channel uh, or uh, the Slack community channel or a, a bunch of hallway chat channels where you can continue the conversation ahead. Uh, thanks again. And uh, please feel free to attend the next sessions or the other sessions. And if you want to know uh, the links for the other sessions, uh, I can send out the links on the chat here. All yeah, right. Thank you. And I'll be here just in case someone pops in in the last five or 10 minutes. Uh, Rajiv, if you can be here. That would be great to, to let people Yeah, um, I'll be here till 9.15 uh, at least. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. So I see someone uh, joined in. Um, uh, Steve Barnett. Yep. Hi. Sorry. I, I think we we kind of wrapped up our session, but I'm okay. I'm I'm happy to happy to talk to you if you have any questions, and I can I can talk some more um, if uh, uh, if need be. Uh, I I do have uh, what we call as a real life cycle for for scientific facilities. Uh, uh, 
a, a diagram here. And uh, if you have any specific questions, please let me know and uh, we can take it from there. I mean, I think that looks pretty good. I just got out of some other stuff. So I figured I'd swing in and see what people were talking about, how things were going. So. Sure, sure. Um, so I think, the, yeah, some of the questions I think we we have, uh, we partially discussed uh, are whether the real life cycle captures the the uh, the different stages that, um, that your facility goes through. Um, um, and uh, I think you are familiar with this work, so um, I would uh, not bore you with, in, with any more details. Uh, but oh, never uh, boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I think more and more um, supporting FAIR principles, uh, migrating to different other platforms, um, uh, experimenting with cloud technologies, see if, if that works or not. These are some of the new issues that that we have been hearing, yeah, hearing more lately. But um, and I I I, I know uh, you know Ice Cube did an experiment with, uh, with using the uh, cloud platforms, right? So mm -hmm. we did uh, we did uh, um, uh, read that uh, read that paper, and uh, I think there was a presentation in either it was um, I don't know it's a CAS meeting or where we basically presented. Uh, the different configurations of the multi-cloud providers. And, uh, but at the end of the presentation, I pretty much asked whether you're going to migrate to clouds for, uh, uh, for ice cube processing. And the answer was pretty much no, it's because of the cloud, because of the cost concerns, right? Even, if, yep. e even without uh, the data egress charges, just the computing, I think uh, the back of the envelope calculation doesn't, doesn't make cloud attractive for uh, for ice cube but it might be attractive for for some other facilities where uh, uh, it depends on depends on the amount of processing and uh, like for example in ice cube the data egress might not be as as uh, as costly as the um, as the compute cost but but for many other facilities which primarily serve the data to the community of users, uh, distributing that data itself will be hard. I mean, because people, yes. are, you know, people are used to getting data for free, right? Yes, and yep. Whenever, uh, suddenly when they realize that to get data out of the cloud, it, it costs them <laughs> money for every byte they transfer out, right? Uh, that's a yes. very different model and mindset that, that people have to, uh, start wrapping their heads around, right? So, yep. yeah, I, I, there are definitely other solutions to to get around that problem, but mm -hmm. you really need to plan for that. Or you could you could have like a on-prem backup and you could serve it from on-prem and you could, you could, you, you could have uh, different things, right? You could negotiate with the providers to have like a Cloud Connect or uh, express route kind of thing, and then you could get that cost down. But but as soon as you let it loose, um, it becomes uh, it becomes hard, right? And yep. supposedly there was an experiment done at NASA. One of the officer participants mentioned that that they tried experimenting with this model and they just blew their budget within the first few days. Yep. So um, yeah, so you know it's. Uh, any new toy, they have their pros and cons, right? So it's yes. um, well, sometimes. I think, hmm? yeah. so I think one of the things that will, in like in the cloud platforms, you know, and I'm seeing this across multiple uh, areas of dealing with clouds and software as a service sort of thing, is keeping the cloud providers or the service providers honest in some ways, and so you know looking and saying, okay, if I upload all of my data, you know, and we decide we're going to use Amazon, well, you know, <clears throat> the key calculation they need to do is, you know, how much will it cost for them to, you know, leave and, yeah. you know, set the price at $1 below that, right? Yeah. So, yeah. You know, and so the, the ability to sit down and say, look, you know, we're going to use the, the commodity aspect of, providing you know, or the, uh, that the cloud providers offer 
and as soon as they try to raise the price, we simply shift to you know a different provider. You know that mobility, I think, will be key, and that that's a different a different set of systems in many ways. Right, and uh, and and whenever you have this type of concerns, uh, we're trying to uh, advise um, a lot of the facilities that you try to have a leverage on your side saying that maybe you can keep a copy of data to yourself, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And then you have a lot more leverage uh, when moving from one cloud to the other, right? And then you are not paying the egress charges to move the data from say Amazon to Azure, right? Yep. Uh, you'd say, okay, I have a backup here. I don't care about the data anymore. I'm, good. I'm just going to use Azure and I'm just going to populate it because ingre ingress is free, right? So yep. uh, I'm going to populate it from my, uh, from my on-prem, right? So but then it becomes, again, a lot more complicated to manage and maintain this, this hybrid scenario. So yep. there's a cost for everything, right? Yep. And, uh, uh, but uh, somewhere it's, again, it's a multi-dimensional optimization problem, as I always say, right? I mean, you, Absolutely. You, there's cost, there's performance, there is operational constraints, there are, uh, it's it's a it's a space that needs to be really planned out and thought through, rather mm -hmm. than rather than just going with a solution and and hoping that it's going to going to work right within the yeah. within the constraint. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it it adds another whole set of uh, complexities to you know data management. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. we, we replicate into the clouds and we do things, you know, okay, results come out, you know, mm -hmm. you know, how do we know what's where, you know, if I want to run, if I want to process a chunk of data, you know, where should I be processing it right now? Where does it exist? You know, do I have mm -hmm. to, do I have to get it or, you know, and then, uh, you know, when I have results, how do I make sure they get put someplace permanent, not just in the, the cloud buckets that I delete because it costs too much this week? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what is IceCube's take on uh, this supporting FAIR principles? This is coming up very often nowadays whenever you talk to facilities. So what, what's, uh, what's your angle to it? Um, I mean, I think we generally support it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, it offers uh, some definite challenges. Um, you know, in what we, what we do. Um, but, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, it's definitely, you know, all of those things are all good, uh, you know, I guess from our perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's some parts of it, you know, that obviously it's like, okay, you know, looking and deciding when, you know, when data becomes public and exposed, you know, versus internal and privately analyzed and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. you know, is really a, you know, a very kind of hot topic for us, uh, you know, because okay. our model has been in, uh, you know, we have the data, we do our own internal processing as we publish results, we publish the data to go with it. All right. Uh, but it seems like there are pressures that uh, come in some ways kind of from the astronomy community where they just, you know, they take the data and then it's just out there and, you know, and you know, individual researchers or citizen scientists can pour through it as well. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and, mm -hmm. and what would that do? Uh, you know, in terms of um, you know how our collaboration operates. Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, in a way, it's um, it's re relatively less relevant for IceCube than for a facility, say like Sage Gauge or OI or Neon, which are which are primarily um, distributing their data stacks, right? Their, mm -hmm. their collection. And uh, m those facilities uh, rarely do processing for the users inside their facility, right? So mm -hmm. whatever they do is mostly the standard processing, like, like your level two processing maybe, right? Yep. So mm -hmm. standard processing, standard products, and then they are, they're distributing it. So for those facilities, um, supporting supporting fair principles is is a lot more structured exercise than 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 say for Ice Cube, where it's pretty much is mostly a collaborative model rather than it's a it's a fan out model, right? So 
So those procedures mostly you have you have the data and then just finding out to 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 your research community, right? So yep. IceCube does that partially, but then there's a there's a large portion of IceCube which is just this collaborative processing across this distributed resources, right? And yep. it's it's kind of difficult to um, to actually answer what fair means in, means in this context. Is does fair mean only for the last bits of data that uh, that the community generates? Uh, this or does fair encamp encompass every data element? That uh, that IceCube produces, that IceCube collaboration produces, right? So yep. it's a different um, it's a different take, and uh, it's uh, it's hard to answer that question from from your perspective, if I understand correctly. So. Well, it has yeah, it has some you know potentially profound impacts, you know, largely on you know on the budget process, right? So we have a portion of our budget comes from the National Science Foundation, but there's another portion of the budget that comes from the the collaborating members. Uh, in the institution or in the collaboration, you know, each of those institutions, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you know sends money. Now, if we said, okay, you know, let's reconceive of ourselves as, um, you know, as one of the others where we simply get it to level two and then we, we make it available, we release it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, at that point, then, you know, it, it uh, we get some very different, you know, a very different model and we say okay wait a minute you know do we then have to go back to nsf and say hey this portion of the you know the budget which was coming from you know yeah. contributions in these other areas is now gone yeah. um yeah you know, and, and that you know those are the sorts of issues we run into if we you know go there uh you know but you can look and say okay you know at some point uh mm -hmm. you know there is you know we do have you know we have to release the data uh, mm -hmm. And you know, when you look at the the principles that are are laid out in that fair framework, at least if we're internally following them, so that there's no distinction, you know, in dealing with the data between what we deal with internally and what's eventually released, mm -hmm. um, you know, that will smooth out that process. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, right. Sorry to interject. Just wanted to let you know we are at the end of the session. Feel okay. free to continue talking, but I just wanted to let you know. So if you had plans on attending any other sessions, you don't miss that. Sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. Um, I think um, unless Steve, you have more questions, I'll uh, grab no. some. And then. No, no. Thank you much. I, I appreciate okay. you. I, I seeing you uh, even even in these times. Yes. So other times we have met, definitely met in some meeting or some conference, but. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'm, I've just been happy that, uh, you know, we're, you know, that it's happening in these times because go back even 10 years and this sort of interaction would simply not have been possible. So yeah. Yeah. it's not great, but. All right. I okay, think that thank you. concludes the session. If somebody uh, pops in, you can, you can ask if they have a specific question. Uh, I'll be happy to answer that, but the session has ended.